Well, welcome to the Cinnabar. Now today we're going to show you an absolutely fascinating Civil War era firearm. This original Confederate Morse carbine. Now, you might have caught my episode a couple weeks ago where we, we took out a, a Smith carbine uh, made on the Union side of things. Uh, beautiful, beautiful old carbine. We shot it a few times with its rubber cartridges um, and had a great time with it. Now, right after that episode aired, uh, a friend of mine and a good supporter of this channel called me up and he said, Mark, you really need to give equal time to the South. So he brought this Morse carbine for me to... Uh, to share with you folks and actually left it here on consignment and so not only do I get a, the opportunity to handle this and show it to you but then I get to help market it f for the gentleman as well. Now the first thing you'll probably notice about this is the brass frame and of course if we're going to be really accurate it, it was actually termed gunmetal and so it, it's a bronze alloy. It was used quite a lot you know in, in naval artillery and, and, and uh, in that time frame, but was used on the frames of firearms as well. Of course, we all know that uh, New Haven Arms used a, a similar material in their Henrys and in their 1866s that would come a, a little bit later. Now, the other thing that's really fascinating about this particular firearm is the ammunition that went along with it. You see, George Morse, who designed the firearm, actually designed the ammunition as well, and this is the first fully self-contained centerfire ammunition produced. Now we know that like the Smith carbine, we had a, uh, had a rubber cartridge, the, the uh, Burnsides had a, a metallic cartridge, um, the Spencers had a, a, a rim fire, but this of course is centerfire. Those other two actually we had to cap a, a nipple just like the percussion guns on the outside of the receiver under the hammer, whereas this particular type of ammunition, there was a, a nipple or an anvil built into the cartridge. So it used a, a percussion cap, but it was actually on the cartridge itself. And we'll show this all a little closer later. Um, and then the, the firearm design itself, being a, a breech loader, used a, a really interesting and unique design as well. So. It really looks a lot like the later trap doors, except in reverse. You see the, the door opens up to the back instead of the front. And so we would load this, of course, as a dummy cartridge. We'll load it in this way and close it up. And we're ready to fire. And of course, we have to have the hammer back in order to open and close that door. And I'll show you why later. We're, we'll take some real close-ups of this and we're even gonna take the side plate off and, and look at how the mechanisms all work together. Okay, so we can let the hammer down now. And of course, again, this, this is a dummy round. It's not gonna go off in the shop. Now there's a interesting history, of course, with, with any Confederate arms there is. You know, obviously the South did not have the manufacturing capacity that the North did. In fact, I was just reading the other day that in the, in the North, they produced during the Civil War era over 300,000 carbines for the war effort. And in the South, all combined, it was less than 20,000. Now these, these Morse carbines, they only produced a little over a thousand. It depends on, on who you talk to and, and uh, what information you're getting, but somewhere between a thousand and twelve hundred. And, and they didn't get to produce them until really late in the war. And the reason for that is, is when, when the war broke out, um, the manufacturing equipment for these Morse carbines was at Harper's Ferry. And of course the, the, the South took over Harper's Ferry and then it went back and forth over and over again. But when the, when the Southern troops captured Harper's Ferry, they, they took that equipment, moved it over to, to Nashville. Um, and George Morse was, was the superintendent of manufacturing there. Well, it wasn't long until the Union overran Nashville and the Confederates took that equipment out ahead of it and took it down to Atlanta. And of course, we all know what happened in Atlanta when, when General Sherman marched on, on Atlanta, then the, the equipment was moved out ahead to Greenville, South Carolina. And it was there long enough that they finally started producing these, these Morse carbines. 
And they actually, the Confederate government never ordered any of these, but the South Carolina state militia did. And and like I say, they 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 produced around eleven to to twelve, or a thousand to twelve hundred of them. We don't know how many of them actually saw action. Um, there just isn't a lot of good records out of the South, of course, um, that survived anyway. Um, we do know that, that some of them saw action because there's been pickups of, of ammunition uh, in, battle, in the battlefield. So um, we're, we're pretty confident that, that they did, but we don't know how many of them. Now, when, when Sherman then marched through South Carolina and captured uh, the arsenals there, there's at least some record that at least 400 of these were destroyed, and we don't know for sure that they were all destroyed, or you know, some of them may have been taken by Union soldiers as souvenirs. But all told, we know that there just weren't a lot of them produced, and certainly not a huge amount of them have survived today. Now, this George Morse, who is the nephew of uh, Samuel F. B. Morse of uh, Telegraph and Morse Code fame, um, he had he had actually gotten a contract before the war with with the federal government to produce these carbines but again like a lot of inventors of the time he had a really good idea but he didn't have the manufacturing capacity he really struggled he never produced any of them then he got a contract to retrofit some of the earlier muskets with this this same kind of trapdoor design uh, they just kind of got started on that when, when the war broke out so uh, he, of course, was from, I think, Louisiana and sided with the South and kind of the, the rest is history now. So let's take a little closer look at how this thing operates. And it's really, really simple. And, and some of the brilliance in this design is, is really in the simplicity. Okay, we'll take a little closer look at this beautiful piece of history. You can see that the gunmetal frame has, has been cleaned at some point in the distant past and is starting to take on that, that uh, patina that we like to see. If we look back here, we see that instead of, of walnut, like a, a lot of guns of the time had for a stock, this actually has a maple stock. And while it has a, a real good straight grain, uh, they did leave some defect in it. We can see a knot that goes through here, but uh, a, a decent looking stock. The thing that's a little surprising is how thin it is. Look at that. Just a, a really thin, to, to uh, save on weight I, I would imagine. Of course we've got a, a gunmetal butt plate back here. Uh, fairly interesting design here. Now this looks like it would have kind of a dual purpose. It's almost kind of a semi-pistol grip to, to hold on to and also for the troopers they could use it as a sling ring and, and hang on to it. Um, of course we we saw the kind of a trap door. The hammer's offset to the one side over here. This this um, catch that we see on the on the front of this trap door wasn't on the early originals and they added it later to to kind of help with keeping this thing closed when they fired the gun. Now there's another another mechanism we'll see inside that helps with that as well. Of course very basic rear sight here just a, a V sight. Again another maple on the front end and a a brass blade front sight that is, is set up where it's dovetailed in there. And then we have uh, a groove here in the underside for a cleaning rod. And it would have had an, originally a steel cleaning rod with a, a brass jag. And, and unfortunately those, those are missing now. Okay, first thing we're going to do is take this side plate off. And we can see how the hammer and sear work and it's very very basic stuff okay all right and we can see here that the the uh, side plate is is serial numbered to the gun this one's serial number 644 and so all we've got here, we've got our, our, our trigger here with a, a small trigger spring on it. We've got our main spring here 
our hammer here. You can't see it very well, but there's a half cock notch and a full cock notch in the hammer. And this one has a, there we're in half cock, and what typically you would like to see is that it, the sear's captured, we can't pull the trigger in half cock. And then on full cock, it, it, it has a tremendously difficult trigger pull, or very, very strong. I think we measure it in tons rather than pounds. <laughs> and then you may be able to see here, instead of, of this hammer striking something right in front of it, it actually is attached to a rod here. And that rod goes forward and hits another rod that's, that's in here, and then that's what hits the firing pin and pushes it into the, um, the percussion cap on the anvil in this um, ammunition. So really simple stuff. Okay, now I mentioned about how we have to have it in full cock before we can open this trap door, or this latch here. And the reason for that is this rod that we can see that's attached to the hammer actually seats inside of this housing when, when the hammer's down. And that's, that helps to keep this down when we fire the gun. Okay, so as we bring this up, we see we've got an arm on either side, and this is really the bolt, just this short or thin part right up here in front. And if we get a get a look at here, then we can see that there's there's the rod here that actually hits the the firing pin, and the firing pin protrudes out quite a ways. And the reason for that is that on the back of these cartridges, that anvil is recessed back in there. A long way, so it has to really have to push that to get up in there. Okay, then there's there's a uh, extractor, which is, is basically just a long uh, spring here that's curved up at the end to catch the the uh, cartridge rim, and that pulls it out. There isn't an extractor as a, or a, an ejector, as I showed you earlier. You basically just have to tip the receiver upside down, and it falls out. Okay, very, very simplistic design, but way ahead of its time. Now, as I mentioned, these 50 caliber Morse carbine cartridges were a real innovation, being the, the first fully self-contained metallic cartridge with its own primer that, that fit right on the cartridge itself. But they were extremely difficult to make. You see, rather than being drawn out of a single piece of brass like we were used to with today's uh, brass, it was actually formed around a mandrel with a seam in it that had to be soldered up. And then they had to turn up the other end and solder in that anvil. You know, an extremely expensive and time-consuming consu process. And I'm sure that the uh, cavalry troops for the South that used these were strongly encouraged to save their brass because these would have been extremely difficult and expensive. And the, and the South already was struggling with, with um, manufacturing at the time. So anyway, when this when this gun came in, you, you know if you've watched this channel that we don't like to just talk about them. We like to take you along and shoot these things. So the, the owner brought this in and not only was okay with me test firing it, but was very encouraging to test fire. So the first thing I did, of course, was run out and get some of this brass from Track of the Wolf. They make some reproduction brass for, for uh, some reproduction Morse carbines that were made in the past. They, they do look like they're turned out of a solid piece of brass and then they've just got a screw in uh, nipple, which is a better design for sure. And went out and, and slugged the bore on this thing. Interestingly enough, this bore is nearly identical to that Smith carbine that we fired here a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, equal, this, equal width, lands and grooves, three grooves, three lands, about 518 diameter. Um, so, you know, maybe they were, were in the 1850s we're going to share the rifling machines that we're going to rifle both these barrels who knows but anyway so we've got we've got our brass and we're, we're ready to go now and, and maybe load up a few cartridges but lo and behold then we as i was really evaluating this this firearm i found that it's had a slight modification that's not going to let it uh, fire these percussion caps on this on this typical uh, nipple here because it's got a small firing pin that's been added to the, the striker. 
So it, it's been modified to fire a, a later, uh, either a, a Boxer or a Burdan primer. And if, if we're hitting the center of these, of course, the, the nipple, it, we want to hit around the edges. And usually the, the, that striker is either a separate striker or in the hammer is a little convex or concave, I should say, so that it hits the edges rather than the center. So then the, the question becomes, what cartridge was it redesigned to fire? And the most obvious candidate would be the 5070. That, that came out a little later after the Civil War. Uh, the dimensions are almost identical, although the 5070 is a, a bit longer, um, maybe a quarter of an inch longer. And, and so, first thing I did was see if we could chamber a 5070. And lo and behold, it comes up about a quarter inch short of chambering. So that tells me that the uh, chamber wasn't, wasn't deepened for this 5070 and I can't find anything else that, that would really fit so I, I'm kind of thinking that it's a possibility that the chamber was left alone and maybe they used some 5070 cut down the brass a little bit and and were able to use it that way so we've got a little mystery to solve now so let's uh, get set up and we'll do a chamber cast of this thing and just see exactly what the chamber looks like okay so here's a, a close up of this striker here and you can see that that firing pin protrusion is right in the center of that striker. Now interestingly enough when we've got this opened up we see that on the breech block there's a Roman numeral maybe you can see it uh, eight here a V and, and three I's and we saw that exact same marking on the inside of the side plate here. There's also a, an R stamped here with three punch dots over the top. I don't know exactly what that signifies. And then another serial number up on this, this uh, top cover here. Maybe you can see that if we change the angle a little bit. But anyway, so it looks like everything's numbers matching as far as we can see on, on this gun. Now, here we put a, a 5070 in and you can see that it just doesn't quite want a chamber. All right, so let's see how this chamber cast came out. We just got a half inch wooden dowel here to, to pop it out of there. There it goes. And uh, we can compare now. Yeah, I do believe it's, that chamber hasn't been modified at all, which is really great news. Okay, so here's our chamber cast here, our 50 caliber Morse carbine dummy round here, and an empty piece of 5070 brass here. And hopefully you can see this all right, but it's pretty obvious the transition between the, the body and the throat in that chamber is right in here, which coincides almost perfectly with this um, 50 caliber Morse carbine cartridge. So I really have to believe that yeah, they, they converted this so that it would fire these 5070 cartridges, but they just trimmed these 5070s back. We can see that, that the, the neck of this is, is quite a bit forward where we hit this transition here. So if we trim this back some, it's going to fit perfectly in here. And then, of course, with that firing pin on the striker, uh, it should fire this, this cartridge really well. Okay, just to satisfy my own curiosity, I went ahead and capped one of these Morse carbine cartridges and and dropped the hammer on it. It did exactly what I expected it to. We just put a, a dimple in this percussion cap in the center of it and it didn't go off. So we run over the lathe, turn down a couple of these 5070s to the proper length and we can see that these are virtually identical in, in every regard to these Morse carbine cartridges, of course, except for how they're primed. And now we put a primer in this one. Uh, let's get that focused. And ready to go out and see if maybe this thing will, will at least set this primer off. I don't know why it wouldn't, but it never hurts to test. All right, let's see if we did any good. Hey, I like it. Let's go blow it up a couple rounds. Okay, so it's time to see how the old girl shoots. <laughs> now that's 
a gun I never expected to shoot on this channel. Let's try her again. Oh, what fun. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now I have to admit, those were blanks I was shooting through this old girl. You know, as much as I would like to load up some live ammo and shoot through this beautiful old piece of American history, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I'm sure it would handle it just fine. There's no reason it wouldn't. Um, but, you know, just no reason to take a chance on a museum piece like this. Now, I did leave that, that center fire firing pin on the striker. Um, so, you know, the next owner can make a decision whether they want to leave it there and, and, and still able to shoot those, those short and 50, 70 cases or the, it just take a, a few minutes to, to remove it and could shoot those, those uh, reproduction uh, Morse carbine cartridges that we have as well. Um, but thanks for joining us today. This has been a, a, just a blast for me. I, I hope you've enjoyed this as well to, to see this, this old beauty back in action again after who knows how long. Well, thanks for joining us. Until next time, happy trails from the Cinnabar.